In this video, we're going to focus on lipids. So lipids would be the fats and oils that you've seen in everyday life. These include fatty acids, triglycerides, phospholipids, steroids, waxes, terpenes, prostaglandins, and things like that. Now lipids are nonpolar, which means that they're mostly hydrophobic. That is, they don't mix well with water. Hydro means water, phobic means fear, and they try to stay away from water. Now lipids are mostly made up of carbon-hydrogen bonds. They're hydrocarbons. Now they may contain other elements like oxygen and sometimes nitrogen in the case of phospholipids and phosphorus too. But for the most part, they contain mostly CH bonds and CH bonds are nonpolar. And it's because of the CH bonds that lipids are hydrophobic, that they don't mix well with water. Now lipids such as triglycerides, they're very useful for long-term energy storage. If you're fasting, if you're not eating for more than a day or so, after your body burns out all the carbs, the next thing that it looks for are the triglycerides in your system, the lipids. And it uses enzymes such as lipase to break down triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol so that your body can derive energy from these molecules. So they're very useful for long-term energy storage. Your body can go days without food. As long as you have water, you can go many days without food because of these triglyceride molecules. They're very effective in storing energy. In fact, they can store more than twice the amount of energy compared to carbohydrates. Now, lipids also play a major role in the cellular membrane. In fact, the cell membrane is mostly made up of phospholipids. Now, lipids also provide thermal insulation and protection. So they're very useful in the winter when it gets cold. But now let's talk about each of these lipids one at a time. So let's begin with fatty acids. What are fatty acids? Fatty acids are long chains of hydrocarbons that contain a carboxylic acid functional group at the end. So here's an example of a fatty acid. So this right here represents a carbon atom. And those carbon atoms contain hydrogen atoms. Keep in mind, carbon can only form four bonds. So the carbon atoms in the middle have two hydrogen atoms, whereas the one at the end possess three hydrogen atoms. So as you can see, a fatty acid is mostly made up of hydrocarbons. The carboxylic acid portion of a fatty acid is the polar part. So this is the part that likes water. That's the, the hydrophilic part. And the tail of the fatty acid is the nonpolar part. So that is the hydrophobic part, the part that doesn't like water. Now, this type of fatty acid is known as a saturated fatty acid. It's saturated in that it contains the maximum number of hydrogen atoms that you can pack on this molecule. And there's no double bonds. Saturated fatty acids are solid at room temperature. A good example of this would be butter. An unsaturated fatty acid has a double bond. So it looks something like this. Because of the presence of the double bond, there's a, a kink in the structure. This molecule, it bends. So that's an example of an unsaturated fatty acid. For every double bond present, you lose two hydrogen atoms. Unsaturated fatty acids tend to be liquid at room temperature. So these would include the vegetable oils. Now, another type of unsaturated fatty acid are the trans fatty acid. In this configuration, we have a cis double bond because the hydrogen atoms across the carbons that are double bonded are on the same side of the double bond. In a trans fatty acid, the hydrogen atoms 
on the double bond are on opposite sides. So that's an example of a trans unsaturated fatty acid. Now let's talk about triglycerides. So what we're going to do is take a three carbon molecule called glycerol. Glycerol has three hydroxyl groups and we're going to react it with three fatty acids. The first fatty acid is a saturated fatty acid. The second one is a monounsaturated fatty acid because we only have one double bond. When you have multiple double bonds, you have a polyunsaturated fatty acid. A triglyceride is composed of three fatty acid molecules and one glycerol molecule. Now to make it, we need a dehydration synthesis reaction. So we're going to lose water. The molecule will be, these molecules will be dehydrated due to the loss of water. So we're going to lose three water molecules, and then we're going to synthesize a larger compound. So it's a dehydration synthesis process. And this will produce a triglyceride, which looks like something like this. Now, I might have lost track of the number of carbon atoms I had at the beginning, but I just want to show you the general shape of a triglyceride. So this is an example of a triglyceride. So this molecule is very useful for long-term energy storage. That's one of its major functions. You can pack a lot of energy into this molecule. The triglyceride is nonpolar. It doesn't mix well with water. It doesn't have the polar hydroxyl groups, so it can't hydrogen bond with water. So to review, in order to make a triglyceride, we need to react glycerol with three fatty acids, and that's going to make the triglyceride producing three water molecules, and that is a dehydration synthesis reaction. But now we can also go backwards if we want to. The reaction between water and the triglyceride can produce glycerol and the three fatty acids. Going backwards, the reaction is called a hydrolysis reaction. Hydro means water, lysis means to split apart. So we're splitting apart the triglyceride into its components, glycerol and the fatty acids. Now let's move on to our next category, phospholipids. These are lipids with a phosphate group. So a phospholipid is made up of a phosphate group, a glycerol molecule, and two fatty acid chains. In this example, we have a saturated fatty acid and an unsaturated fatty acid. The R group does contain a nitrogen atom, by the way, just in case you have a test question on that. So phospholipids contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Phospholipids make up the cell membrane. As you can see in this picture, this is the phospholipid bilayer. Now a phospholipid has a polar head and two nonpolar tails. The kink that you see in the structure is due to the presence of this double bond in the unsaturated fatty acid. The phosphate group is polar, so it likes water. So that's the part that's going to be facing water. The two fatty acid tails, they don't like water. So this is the hydrophobic region of the cell membrane. That's the part that wants to stay away from water. So this would be the inside of the cell, which is aqueous. It has water in it and this is outside of the cell. But the membrane of the cell, in the interior, it's hydrophobic. Now the next category of lipids that we're going to talk about are steroids. Steroids contain four 
fused rings, as you can see in the examples listed on the screen. Now the first one that we're going to talk about is cholesterol. Cholesterol is used to maintain the fluidity of the cell membrane. On the upper right, we have estradiol, which is a type of estrogen, the primary female sex hormone. On the bottom left, we have testosterone, which is an androgen, and that is the primary male sex hormone. Estradiol and testosterone, they're chemically similar. Besides both having estradiol and testosterone are chemically similar. Besides both having four fused rings, estradiol and testosterone both have this hydroxyl group at the top. But estradiol really stands out due to the presence of this aromatic ring, which is not present in testosterone or in cholesterol. Cortisol is another steroid hormone that is used to reduce inflammation by suppressing the immune system. Now let's say if you're stressed out, you have a lot of exams to study for. When your stress levels are high, your cortisol levels will be high as well. Now when used as a medication, cortisol is known as hydrocortisol. So those are some steroids, which are lipids that you may need to know. Now the next type of lipid that we need to talk about are waxes. Waxes are nonpolar. They don't mix well with water. Waxes contain very long alkyl chains, as you can see in this picture above. But they can have many different functional groups. Here we have a paraffin wax with 31 carbon atoms. The functional group is an alkane. An alkane is an organic molecule that only contains carbon and hydrogen. It doesn't have any double bonds. So it's a saturated compound. Below, we have a wax ester. We still have two long alkyl chains, but we do have an ester functional group. So it's called a wax ester. This one has 32 carbon atoms and 64 hydrogen atoms. So these are very, very long hydrophobic molecules. Some examples of waxes include beeswax, I'm sure you heard of that one, or the waxes that plant use to coat themselves in order to regulate evaporation and hydration, and even candles. Candles are made up of waxes, specifically the paraffin wax. Waxes have very high melting points. This particular paraffin wax has a melting point of 99 degrees Fahrenheit, and its boiling point it's 698 degrees Fahrenheit. So at room temperature, waxes are solids. But if you raise the temperature, you can melt them into a liquid. Now the next type of lipid that we need to talk about are terpenes. The basic unit of a terpene is isoprene. Isoprene has five carbon atoms and it's a diene. Whenever you see the suffix ene, that tells you that it's an alkene, it has a double bond. Di means two, so a diene is a substance with two double bonds. Triene would be three double bonds. Other examples of terpenes include myrcene and limonene, which is found in the peels of citrus fruits. And then we have beta carotene. So this is found in carrots. Myrcene has 10 carbon atoms. So therefore it has two it's made up of two isoprene units. So terpenes typically have carbon atoms that are multiples of five. Now here's a pop quiz for you, or a test question. How many isoprene units are needed to make beta carotene? What would you say? What you need to do is count the total number of carbon atoms in beta carotene. So you can pause the video and do that, but you should get 40 carbon atoms. And all you need to do is divide this by five. This will give you the number of isoprene units that are needed to make beta carotene. So in this case, that would be eight isoprene units. If we look at limonene, it has one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten carbon atoms. So ten divided by five will give us two. So it takes two isoprene units to make up limonene. Limonene is an example of a cyclic terpene because it has a, a ring. So that's it for terpenes, another type of lipids that you may need to be familiar with. Now let's move on to our last category, eicosanoids. So there's three categories of eicosanoids that I'm going to talk about. The prostaglandins, the thromboxanes, and the leukotrienes. The prostaglandins have a five carbon ring and they have a total of 20 carbon atoms. The thromboxanes, they have a six membered ether containing ring. The leukotrienes, even though they have four double bonds, they have three conjugated double bonds. These are double bonds that alternate with single bonds. So these are all lipids. And notice that they all have a carboxylic acid functional group. Prostaglandins are used as vasodilators. They can widen blood vessels. They can also inhibit platelet aggregation. Thromboxanes, they kind of work in reverse. Thromboxanes, they can facilitate platelet aggregation. They have a role in clot formation. And in addition, they work as vasoconstrictors, which means they can make the blood vessel smaller. They can cause it to be more narrow. Leukotrienes are like signal molecules. They serve as inflammatory mediators. So those are some of the functions of these three types of eicosanoids. So that's it for this video. That's all I got. Thanks for watching, and if you like it, don't forget to subscribe.